generations to come. Good morning, it is January 18th at 11.09 a.m. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the TDN. And I co-host a radio show on Sirius XM every Saturday with Dave Johnson. Please tune in. Hey, guys. Happy January 18th. I'm uh, Randy Moss with NBC Sports with uh, Lucy standing guard in the background. Zoe Cabman here with First Racing and Santa Anita and XBTV. Doodles right behind me. It's January the 18th and I am flying through dry January, guys. I just wanted to throw that out there. Wait a minute. Dry January? I don't follow. Fill me in. Yeah. It's yeah, raining a lot out there. What do you mean? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> duh. Sorry about that. I'll yes. Uh, Santa Anita, of course, had to cancel over the, the uh, on Saturday and on, on Monday over the weekend. Speaking of Santa Anita, I wanted to kick off the story. You know, look, as writers, we spend a lot of time talking about the bad news in horse racing because, it, frankly, there is a lot of bad news. It's nice to talk about the good news. And going back to 2019 was one of the darkest periods in racing history. Lucy just moved, by the way. I mean, about an eighth of an inch. <laughs> okay. It's shocking, I know. Yeah, shocking. Okay. 2019, one of the worst chapters in horse racing history when there was all those breakdowns at Santa Anita. It was front page news on the LA Times and all and, and on the six o'clock news every night. I mean, a really awful period. And some people were really thinking that the sport was going to perhaps be outlawed in California. Zoe's employer, the Stronet Group First Racing, they got together and said, we've got to fix this darn thing. Fast forward about three and a half years later, boy, have they fixed it. And they provided us with some statistics this week. In 2022, there was not a single breakdown in a dirt race at Santa Anita during the entire year. Now, there still were 12 fatalities. We want the number to be zero, but they were along the lines of other things, some sudden deaths. There were horses in training. In the afternoon, racing on the dirt, no fatalities. And that comes on the heels of a Del Mar year where at both meets, zero fatalities during racing as well. Uh, Randy, certainly welcome good news. And, you know, you've got to give the Stronach Group tremendous amount of credit. It looks like they've gone from one extreme to the other. Well, they deserve a tremendous amount of credit. And I don't think, given the uh, the stature of the animal rights lobby nowadays in, uh, in, in the 20th, 21st century, I don't think it's um, a sensationalistic take to say that the very existence of Santa Anita might have been in question unless they turn things around. And it took a group effort. It took the racetrack. It took the veterinarians. It took the horsemen to all collaborate and try to get this thing turned around. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think you're going to get um, nearly as much news coverage on the TV and in the newspapers about what Santa Anita has done positively since then as you got in terms of negative coverage back in 2019. But that's just the nature of the news cycles and the nature of the beast. But yes, I agree that they deserve a tremendous amount of credit for getting a handle on this. Zoe, you're yeah. right there. Your boots on the ground. What is going right? Uh, I mean, everything is going right. Kudos to uh, the Stronach Group, First Racing, and the Horsemen, because there are a lot of old school horsemen out here that didn't take lightly to the veterinary checks that went on. But at the end of the day, you have to acquiesce for horse racing to move forward in California. There's a vegan restaurant on every corner. This is a different country we're living in, in Southern California. California on a whole is completely different. I always feel like we're on an island out here. And as far as horse racing, we are. And the fact that we had to acquiesce just a little bit to Peter, a lot of people were saying, well, why are you bending over to, you know, placate those guys. Well, this is the world that we live in. And we were in very, very much danger of shutting down. So I think there were, let me see, I wrote it down, 5,381 veterinary exams performed on 4,673 horses last year in California. And it just goes to show the scrutiny these horses are under. And some of them pass and some of them don't. And it's down to the horsemen and the vets on whole. And, of course, we have the best track maintenance here in Southern California as well to just get this thing going. And it's going in the right direction. It's not perfect. I'm not sure it could ever be perfect when you're dealing with four-legged animals. Uh, but it's certainly on the right track. 
Yeah, and, and one of the things I learned from writing this story was the how successful these veterinary checks have been. And, you know, basically to put it into, you know, layman's uh, uh, language, they basically put all these horses under a microscope and they're not going to let anything slip through the cracks. But it makes me wonder about racing as a whole. And, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but when the jockey club puts out its numbers at the end of the year, end of a fiscal year, you know, the amount of breakdowns is going down, but it's not going down as dramatically as it has or anywhere near as dramatically as it has at Santa Anita, which leads me to to say, why isn't everybody doing what they're doing at Santa Anita? I know it's, you know, it may not be that practical for other tracks. It, I'm sure it's very costly. It's very time consuming. And, you know, maybe a lesser track just can't, doesn't have the manpower to do something like this. But my goodness, if this is working as well as it is at Santa Anita to have these veterinary checks, it should be done everywhere. You know, we shouldn't just be talking about Santa Anita having no breakdowns. We should be talking about horse racing having as close to no breakdowns as we can possibly get. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it's not just the case in horse racing. It's the case with every other sport and life in general. A lot of times these draconian measures aren't taken unless something's put under a microscope and a racetrack is getting, you know, tremendous negative publicity. Arlington Park had a similar situation way back when, and it led to them switching from a dirt surface to a synthetic surface. It, it's been a whole sea change mm -hmm. out in Southern California. I mean, when you think back to what happened in 2019, it wasn't just the lack of veterinary oversight. It wasn't just trainers perhaps pushing the envelope a little too much. If you remember, there was a pretty strong weather component to that in 2019, right. a very rainy season. The track had to be compacted to get the water off of it over and over and over. And now look what happened this past weekend, a very rainy weekend and Santa Anita just said, we're going to cancel Saturday's racing card. You would never have seen that, I don't think, back in 2019. So a lot of things have changed. And there's a statute that's been put forward that if the track is sealed, they have to have a meeting with the Jockeys Guild. There are like four or five different entities that have to meet together and decide whether racing is safe to go ahead. And I think they're just basically going on the side of caution, which is a very good thing. And to echo your point about Arlington, I'm, is it me? I was at Arlington during that terrible rash of breakdowns. I was here. I've seen firsthand Peter camped out at Arlington Park. Peter camped out at Santa Anita. Greyhouse Ra Greyhound Racing is gone in Florida. So, I mean, these are real things that go on. Unless you've seen it firsthand, I mean, there were some days it was hard to even drive in the gates at Santa Anita because they right. were picketing outside. This is real, absolutely real, mm -hmm. the things that are going on. And, you know, yes, it's not sounded out in the news right now. But as far as I'm concerned, no news is good news. Right. And, you know, everybody in horse racing loves to hate PETA. And that's, you know, fine. There's They give you a lot of reasons to dislike them. And people, I'm sure, were very unhappy with the news coverage. Um, Zoe, you were there. You, you you lived through it, you know, from a distance. I, I, I wouldn't get the same feel that you did. But Aiden Butler, uh, the COO of, of Horse Racing, told me about, you know, the helicopter, you know, the buzz of the helicopters overhead. But had that not happened, yeah. I don't think we'd be where we are today. Thank and you. look, you don't like it. You don't want it to ever come. And, you know, PETA is public enemy number one for a lot of people in horse racing. But, you know, if this might have happened in 1963, it wouldn't have been a big deal. Nobody would have paid any attention to it and nothing would have been fixed. I'm not saying Santa Anita wouldn't have done the right thing anyways, but the fact that their backs were pushed against the wall by PETA and by the news media obviously made it, uh, made you know, forced the issue quite some bit. So from a, an ugly situation and what a lot of people, I'm sure, considered very unfair treatment, some good definitely came from that. Very and well I said. think a big, I a big round of applause needs to go out to Delmar as well, who has followed right. suit um, with all the protocols in place at Santa Anita. Obviously, Santa Anita runs for seven months of the year, just about, and Delmar runs for almost three so that, there's a little bit of difference there, but the whole of California has really banded together. <laughs> Very good. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The Keeneland January sale concluded last week with solid trade across the board. A total of 962 horses sold for an average price of $47,202, up 3.18% from last year. 
there was a very deep buying bent. The 15 highest priced horses sold to 14 different entities. We look forward to racing at Keeneland in the spring. The Keeneland Spring Meet begins Friday, April the 7th and runs through April the 28th. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, this is racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. He was just put together like a machine and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law pops the cork in the champagne. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law. Tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Mendelssohn, he's on fire in 2023. He's already had five winners so far this year, which is more than any other second crop sire. His most recent winners include Opus 42, who won the Gasparilla Stakes on Saturday at Tampa. Mendelssohn stands for a bargain, 25000 this year at Ashford. Justify's son, Verifying, a half-brother to champ Midnight B. Sue made his three-year-old debut at Oaklawn over the weekend. He earned a 97 buyer speed figure for trainer Brad Cox, and we'll talk about him just a little bit later on in the show, guys. On Monday, there was a milestone that pretty much went unnoticed in horse racing. On January 16, 2013, trainer Rick Dutrow ran a horse at Aqueduct. From that day on until this January 16, 2023, he was essentially, for all practical purposes, suspended for another a, a number of offenses. But he wasn't technically suspended or figuratively or literally suspended. His license was revoked for 10 years. Uh, Dutro is a very controversial figure in New York racing. Um, to put it mildly, he's no choir boy. Um, you know, think what you want of him. Um, and some people think that. You know, he was railroaded. This was the worst thing that ever happened. You know, I'm not so sure about that. He he, he was into a lot of things and did a lot of things that would lead you to believe that, um, you know, maybe that there was some, some problems here. But now the situation is going to become very tricky here. With his license having been revoked, he's got to reapply for a license. That's They're in the process of doing that. And then once the license application is in, will the New York Gaming Commission accept it? So the bottom line question is, have we seen the last of Rick Dutrow or are we getting ready for another chapter of Rick Dutrow? And this would be my opinion on, like I said, again, you know, um, I, I think anybody who says this guy is, you know, uh, greatest trainer in the world, greatest horse in the world, didn't deserve any penalty. They're burying their head in the sand. But if you suspend, if you revoke somebody for their license for 10 years, and you tell them you're, you're, you're gone for 10 years. When the 10 years are up, you can't say, you know what, we're going to make that 12 years. Or we're going to make that 15 years. Or we're going to make that the rest of your career. Imagine if you were sent to prison for 10 years. And on the last day of your sentence, the warden comes in and says, you know what? We changed our mind. Now it's going to be 15 years. You can't do that. So as logical as it seems that they will bring them back, hold on here. We're talking about the New York Gaming Commission, which is just, they make so many bizarre rulings. They make so many rulings that I find, you know, just wrong. And they're very heavy handed. Um, they are not, they, you know, they, we go back to the poor clocker they suspended who did absolutely nothing wrong. And they suspended the guy for a month and find him. That's who we're dealing with. So Randy, I, I don't know if Dr. is coming back or not. I do believe he should be let back, but this will be an interesting situation that everybody needs to keep an eye on. Yeah. A great article you wrote on TDN, by the way, detailing all of this stuff. Uh, you would like to think that the, the board would do the right thing for the reasons that you just articulated, but uh, given like, for example, what you pointed out, the bizarre treatment of the clocker, which just makes no sense whatsoever, then it, it, it calls into question the ability of the board to do the right thing in the Dutro situation. I've, yeah, I've been saying since day one, I, I, I understand that, that, that Rick is no choir boy. Uh, and, and he had transgressions, especially the last one. Uh, I 
could totally go along with a, what I would have considered to be a harsh suspension, which would have been a year or two. But I thought a 10 year ban uh, was totally over the top. And, and I still think it had something to do with the industry's anger at Dutro for the whole big brown steroid episode with, with, with Dutro admitting after the Kentucky Derby or maybe it was after the Preakness that big brown was being treated with anabolic steroids. By the way, just like, you know, almost every other major trainer in America treating some of their horses with. Uh, because they were not illegal. Exactly. It was, it was not right. illegal at the time. Uh, and so I think, I think Dutro was viewed very harshly by many in the industry for short, for sort of outing uh, thoroughbred racing and its use of anabolic steroids at the time. And I thought that played in resentment, played into that to that 10 year suspension. I think he deserves to be brought back. And I hope the I hope the board does the right thing. Yeah, he's behaved perfectly in his 10 year suspension. He hasn't bitched. He hasn't moaned. And I cannot imagine a scenario where he will not get licensed. I, I just can't imagine it. And if there is one, it's bullshit. I, I'm not sure if I can say that, but I'm going to say it. He's served his penance and he deserves the right to come back. Whether you love him or hate him, it doesn't matter. They wanted to give him 15 years, give him 15 years. They gave him 10. There shouldn't be a day more. It and he'll probably do very well when he comes back. I mean, I, I keep thinking back. I mean, I know there were a lot of sus suspicions about Dutro at the time. You know, I mean, that, that might have played in this as well. A lot of public, uh, you know, sentiment among horse players and such because he, he was so successful. But anytime Bobby Frankel would, uh, would bring a horse to New York or, or someplace where he didn't have a, a, a stable presence and Dutro was there, Bobby would always put his horses with Dutro. And I remember Frankel telling me one time that's because he felt that Dutro was one of the best horsemen, one of the best caretakers of horses out there. And for Frankel to say that about Dutro really opened my eyes. So I, I think he'll, he will be successful uh, if and when he returns. Zoe, I, I agree with what you said, but I want to make one more point. Never underestimate the stupidity <laughs> of the New York Gaming Commission. So, you know, let's... I'll leave that to you. I might leave, need to get leave. licensed. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, um, coming up in a little bit, Will Walden, uh, a trainer who's making a lot of news and is a really uh, interesting story, will be um, our Green Group guest of the week. But to, to just get you ready and whet your appetite a little bit about that, Katie Petruniak, our associate producer here with the uh, TDN Writers Room podcast, uh, made a trip out to Turfway Park the other day, and she did a really, really good video with not only Will, but with his team. And uh, I, I don't need to tell you too much because it's all explained in the video, but this is a group of guys battling back from substance abuse and it really appear to have gotten their lives on track. It's a real good story. Listen in. Will Walden's racing stable got off to a fast start in 2022, and they wrapped up the year with their very first stakes winner. We stopped by their barn at Turfway Park and spoke with a few members of the team, which is made up of a group of six men all working together as they recover from substance abuse. I've worked in a, in a lot of racing barns and, and this one's kind of unique in and of itself just because this is all recovery based and oriented. These guys were homeless. They were uh, in jail cells. You know, I, I went through it myself, uh, 12 years of addiction and, and alcoholism and and really what it is, is it's just giving guys a second chance. Horses are therapeutic, you know what I mean? Most of these guys have never touched a horse. Because of where they came from, their hunger for a purpose and a drive in life, um, these horses give that to them. So I've been sober a little over two years and I'd said 90% of me being sober was, was around horses. So on the days that it was hard for me to find God, the horses were there. Never in a million years did I think that I'd actually be riding horses for a living. So I started out hot walking just like uh, anybody does. Um, when we got here, I started hacking and then actually about two or three weeks ago, Will, uh, Will asked me if, uh, if I wanted to run the shed row. I've got maybe, what, five months of experience with horses right now. So still brand new, still learning a lot. The year's going, I mean, <laughs> better than expected. We were 
21% on the year is a stable, uh, 50% in the top three. And uh, we were fortunate enough last month to get our first stakes victory with Kate's Kingdom. The credit goes to this team. They show up every single day. They show up multiple times a day and they break their back for these horses and in turn these horses go out and break their back for them. We're just, uh, we're super grateful with the 15 we have now and uh, we're gonna do everything we can to, to, to get them in the winner's circle to make them successful. It's just the, the connection that you can have with the horses. Cause like, if you really don't feel like dealing with human beings that day, you go in grooming a horse, you know what I mean? Like, and I know they're listening I can feel it. I can see it in their eyes. I feel like with this, like I can finally feel like I can be in the moment. And that's, that's precious to me. The group dynamic, I'd love to tell you it's super professional. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it is. These guys are very serious about what they do and, and they're very serious about their jobs. I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you I about bent to my knees laughing once a day in the shed row. That energy and just love that we have for these horses, you know, it, I don't know, it's, it's, it's contagious. Me personally, I would do this for free. If you just fed me and gave me a few horses to ride, you ain't gotta pay me, don't tell me all that. We enjoy life today. Uh, we enjoy each other's company. We enjoy each other's mentorship. And I, I swear, these horses just kind of respond to it. You know, I know these horses, they rely on us. You know what I mean? Because there is no shed row unless, you know, if this group of guys makes a decision to go do what they used to do, these, you know, I mean, there is no Will Walton racing. Sobriety is our number one thing. And then the care of these horses is number two. Our addiction and alcoholism is no longer this eyesore on our life. It's something, it's now, where it was, you know, the sword that pierced us, it's now the sword we fight with. And as long as people understand that that's the background we come from, we can help people. That's why I do this today um, with Will, because we get all these uh, new guys coming in and that's what it's all about. It's not about me anymore. It's about, it's about these guys that are coming in. At the end of the day, when I lay my head down, I know that I have tried and done my best to help and benefit these guys in their careers. So never in a million years would I think that I'd be where I'm at today, being trusted with, you know, with these guys and these horses. And so it's just, it's been a, it's been a heck of a journey. It really has. Really fantastic piece by Katie Petruniak and really looking forward to speaking to Will Walden just a little bit later on. But right now, guys, let's get to what happened in england yesterday it was the world's best racehorse the longines best racehorse award and it went to an american hurrah it went to flight line rated 140. let's just put this in some context he was equal with frankel i know the handicappers had a lot of difficulty do we go above frankel do we equal it there's a lot of debate over in europe whether he should have been 139 like he got for winning the pacific classic or 140 that he got for winning the Breeders' Cup Classic. So he's basically rated with the world's best racehorse that was Frankel back in the day. Now, 135 was Baid, 126 was Equinox, Nature Strip was 126 as well. Epicenter, for you Eclipse Award voters, was 125, so he was fifth. You can go all the way down to number 16 on the list. Now, take this as you will. Tabor voted 123. To add a little bit more context in here, American Pharaoh won it in 2015 with 134. In 2018, Winx won it with Cracksman with 130. Accelerate was 126. So it's a really good rating system. John Sadler, Jane Lyon, Stephanie Hironis, they were all on hand to accept the World's Best Racehorse Award. And one thing that that really kind of got to me, John got up and, and talked and basically praised the Breeders' Cup and the Jockey Club for this horse winning all these races medication-free. And he got a rousing round of applause from everybody that was there at the banquet, in the banquet room in London, for winning these races medication-free. He's from a family of turf runners. If you watch him train in the morning, he looks like a tough horse. So the fact that he won medication free in all of these races means that I think we're going to get a, a lot of European influx in to breed to Flightline as well. So kudos to the whole team. I thought it was phenomenal.
And it also shows that John's smart enough to play to his audience. <laughs> and Absolutely, he's going right. to talk about, <laughs> talk about being medication free. Wait, the only two logical choices were, were Flightline and Baid. And Baid yeah. lost in the final start of his career in England. And we saw what Flightline did in the Breeders' Cup Classic. So I thought it was a, an outstanding choice. And oh, by the way, this will shock no one. Guess who the Lanes in Stallion of the Week is? Of course. <laughs> It's Lightline. The breeding shed doors are opening soon in Kentucky. We've reported on this before, but a reminder, Flightline will be standing his first season at Lane's End for a fee of $200,000. The same as American Pharaoh started with way back in 2016. We'll be right back after this message from Lane's End. Flightline is in full flight. Flightline turns it on yeah. at the top of the stretch, and he's in cruise control. Take a good look at this because you're not going to see this too often. Maybe never again. Flight line, 20 lengths clear. World-class racehorse, world-class performance, and a world championship event. And now it's time for the Green Group Guest of the Week, sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry with over 500 clients in the horse business. The Green Group has proven strategies to save you taxes. You can learn more at www.greenco.com. And we're now joined by this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Will Walden. We just saw that wonderful video done by Katie Petruniak with Will and his team. Uh, I believe that was at Turfway Park uh, that came out. And Will, we wanted, we were so interested in your story, we wanted to bring you on to expand on it. And the first thing I noticed from there, it wasn't a surprise, but you and your team talked about how much there is the love for the horses and the feel for the horses. And we've heard before from a lot of people what horses can do for mankind. And they've been doing great things with uh, the soldiers coming back from Iraq and, 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 and Afghanistan with PTSD. It, do the fact that you're working with horses, does that make it easier on you and your team as so far as maybe you started a business and working six guys in an office building somewhere? Yeah, well, <clears throat> Zoe just mentioned I need a therapy <laughs> dog and I got 15 of them at the barn, you know? Uh, I think Winston Churchill said it best, right? That the inside of a horse does something for the outside of a man. And, you know, our whole program's kind of cultivated around it. Um, these guys, I mean, as you as you mentioned there, that War Horse Project, um, <clears throat> I can't tell you how many treatment centers uh, that I've been to personally or been around or have reached out to me that have talked about equine ther implementing an equine therapy parts of their program and their kind of curriculum and I don't know, it's just, it's kind of difficult to put into words what these horses do um, for the inside. It's just, I don't know, you know, I'll put it to you this way. Um, when these guys started working with the horses, uh, I told them each, I said, you're not going to be able to know the day or the time. It may happen in two weeks. It may happen in a day. It may happen in four months. But that horse is going to look you in the eye. And you're going to get this feeling inside that that animal accepts you for exactly who you are and exactly where you're at and doesn't care about your past, doesn't care about your future, but accepts you just for who you are. And that's something that in addiction and alcoholism is a feeling that uh, is long and lost. It's very far, far away from the, your present. And, uh, you know, I think there's just something about it and something about these animals that just do something for these guys and myself included. So, Will, maybe. Maybe pride is not the best word, but there has to be a sense of satisfaction that you feel for getting to where you are right now compared to where you were not that long ago. And it, I would think it would be human nature not really to want to talk about the depths that you were in before you pulled yourself out, to sort of forget about that and hope other people forget about it and move on. But yet, You've given so many interviews. You've talked in depth about where you were, uh, including this one. Uh, why? Why do you seem to be so willing to discuss something that other people might want to completely pass off and forget about? Well, look, I mean, the simple answer is I, you know, I don't necessarily want to. Right. But there were guys 
uh, when I was, I went through, I was 12 years of drug, drug addiction, alcoholism. I mean, it was bad. And, um, I wasn't willing to get help or listen to anybody, uh, or, or kind of figure out what this recovery process looked like until they qualified themselves, until they told me exactly where they were, uh, that they ate out of dumpsters, that they were homeless, that they went to jail, that they looked at prison time, that they had felonies, that they had this, or they had that. I wasn't going to listen to them. Right. Uh, they had to, they got vulnerable with me, in which case I was able to get vulnerable. My, when they got vulnerable, my guard went down. Um, so to answer your question, I don't really like drudging up the past all the time and talking about it, but if there's a chance that there's somebody out there listening, that's going through it and doesn't think that anybody can relate, doesn't think that anybody else has been there, doesn't think that anybody else is eating out of dumpsters or went to prison to, uh, they can hear it from me or they can hear it from one of my guys that, Hey, we were in the same spot. You wouldn't think it because of how our life looks like now, what life looks like now and what we get to do on a daily basis. But I can promise you we were there. Um, and there was a million hands reached out, uh, that reached out and grabbed me when I was in the depths of it. And, you know, I can only keep this thing by giving it away. You know, and I want to give it back and help as many people because there were so many people that took time out of their day, time away from their family, away from their kids, away from their jobs, lifestyles, what have you, um, to help rescue me. And uh, if I can do that for just one person, it's worth it. Will, personally for you, what was the tipping point? You mentioned you went through this substance abuse for 12 years. What was it that finally made you sit up and say enough is enough? Well, to get into detail, uh, I was I was living in a motel room um, just outside of Lexington, or I guess in the conf in Lexington, and and I I had been trying to get sober for probably the past four or five years, uh, pretty aggressively, like really wanted. I was miserable, and wanted to get clean and sober, um, and I didn't. I I it, I had gotten kicked out of a house a few weeks prior. And I had basically resigned to the fact that I was going to die a heroin junkie. And that's a, it's a pretty sad state to be in. But my point being is, is I'd quit lying to people. Like people would call me up and ask me what I was doing. And I tell them exactly what I was doing. <clears throat> and there came a point a few weeks after where the phone had completely quit ringing. Uh, and, and the realization kind of set in that Everybody knew what I was doing. They knew what I was out there uh, doing to my body and, and, and doing in my life. And, and the phone wasn't ringing. Nobody was even willing to call to check on me. Uh, in the, the depth of, of, of that kind of, that loneliness uh, is indescribable. Um, it's something that I had, I had been close. I had probably been in worse places physically. Um, but as far as like internally, mentally and emotionally, you know, it, it just it tipped it over for me. I was like, you know what? To hell with the career, um, to hell with uh, the cars, the fame, the fortune, whatever these these unrealistic, uh, you know, fantasies that I had about what my life was going to look like uh, without getting sober. Those were kind of put to the side and. And I, I, I sat down and, and on a piece of it, like looked at it in this hotel room, looked at it and just said, you know, what are three things that I that I want? And and instead of instead of those, it was <coughs> I wanted to be accountable. I wanted my word to mean something. Um, I wanted a family. Uh, I wanted to find a wife um, to spend the rest of my life with and have maybe have a few kids, have a family. And, and most importantly, uh, be a, be a son to my parents, uh, be a brother to my, my, my brothers and sisters, uh, to be a friend to those who, who wanted friendship. Um, all those things I, in, in look, I had to look long and hard at it. And then I had to make that phone call, right? I had to make that phone call that to, uh, to a guy that's probably one of the closest, closest people in my life right now called him and he took me to, took me to treatment. And that was the last time I ever ingested any kind of substance. Um, that was November 23rd of 2020. 
Wow. You you don't do things in half and you are true to your word, Will. Um, in the last year, you started training, you got married, and you have a child on the way. Uh, is this almost yep. to be true? It's uh, Life has happened really fast. Um, and I resigned, you know, when I got clean, I, I resigned to the fact that I was going to have any kind of say in this timeline of how life was going to go for me, right? I I literally given all the liberty uh, and decision-making over to people in my life who were sober. Uh, so I went to work for, I still have the Wendy's uniform. Like that's, that, that was literally, that was it. That was, that's what was in front of me. And that was fine. I was able to show up. I was able to clean the parking lot. I was able to flip fries, flip burgers, um, make orders. I was able to be an accountable employee. And I was cool with that. I had resigned the fact that there was like, I, I wasn't, there was no horse racing in it for me for, a, for the foreseeable future, because I had tried to go back to that fast before um i i tried to go back and fulfill the external wants and needs before fixing the internal problems that i had uh and lo and behold this yeah life life happens fast and and we started training um this whole thing with frank and, and ready made kind of jumped off and uh and then you know at keeneland in the spring i met tessa who's my wife now and and you know, like we sat down and we discussed it uh, prior to we said, look, you know, we explained what we both want. And that was, you know, a family, a future of a marriage. Um, we weren't kind of playing any games. And I said to her, I said, look, we'll give it six months and six months. Um, at the end of six months, I'll either leave you or I'll marry you. And, <laughs> you know, what happened? That's a, we got married. That's an ultimatum. <laughs> yeah, well. Look, I mean, it probably wasn't as blunt as that. I mean, I don't know. It might have been. Might have been. I'm looking at it right now. She said, "Yeah, it, it, it was that blunt." So, um, but yeah, no, it's it's been such a cool journey, and you know, I don't know what the future holds. Uh, right now, we're just trying to stay in today. Uh, we're so fortunate and so blessed to have this little racing stable that's um, had some success over the past year, and and we've got some horses that. Uh, we're actually really excited about and you know we're just we just can't wait to see what the future holds well you just described it as a little racing stable i imagine it's going to grow people see the success that you have had the numbers you have had and your pedigree too you're you know it's let's bring up the fact that in it's very pertinent you're elliot walden's son so uh you mm -hmm. know obviously you come from one of the great racing families uh in, in thoroughbred horse racing um as you continue to grow Will you continue to hire employees who have had substance abuse problems or is it just going to be kind of the tight knit group of six and then you'll hire the same sort of people that any other barn would hire? Yeah. So um, I guess the short answer is I don't know. Uh, we're not we're affiliated, not affiliated on paper, but we have um, the guy who actually the program that I went through um, was a guy with. The guy who ran it was a guy named Christian Counselor, and he has since started his own program, and it's affiliated with TaylorMade called uh, Stable Recovery. And part of his program is it's a 90-day – It's I think it's a three-month to six-month program, and at the end of it, they have the option to come work for us. And it's mm -hmm. kind of this and, – and during the meantime, they get to – I mean, we're just here at Turfway. They're in Lexington. They come – they came to – I mean, I, there was six or seven of them at the race on Saturday. Um, they come up all the time and it's kind of, they get to see their brothers and their peers kind of go on and come up and, and do this thing and talk about it. And um, some of them love the farm life. There's nothing wrong. You know, some of them love kind of that slower pace. Some of them have a little bit more hunger for that action and that, uh, you know, that, com that competition that we, that this, that a racing stable provides. Right. And um, so anyways, like I said, we have we have a we have a little pool of people that we can choose from and plug from as we need employees. It really, I guess, to answer your question, it depends how big the stable gets. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we're we're open to anybody coming. We're not you know we're not going to say no to anybody. You know, uh, if somebody wants to come work for us that isn't in recovery or isn't you know um, hasn't been through, we're not gonna we're not going to turn them down, mm -hmm. not at all. 
So, Will, you had a stakes winner, Kate's Kingdom, at Turfway Park on December the 11th. You've got another filly named uh, T Max, a three year old filly who was, who was second in the stakes at Churchill. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the stable you've got right now. And also, uh, you said you're, you've, you're sort of tempering your, uh, your goals right now, but future goals that you'd like to uh, try to attain. Yeah. So, Kate's Kingdom. Um... She was a filly that Frank Taylor bought out of the Facebook Tipton digital sale at the beginning of November. And we were able, uh, she won a stake for us on December 11th. She actually ran back last weekend, didn't run any good, ended up, uh, I went back to feed that night. She had a temp of 102 um, and a 101 the next day. Um, d- can't really put a finger on it. We pulled blood and whatnot, and, and we just think she was kind of knocked off kilter for that day. Just kind of toss that one and move on to the the ensuing schedule they have at Turfway for these older fillies. She's a really nice filly. Um, extremely grateful to have her. She's cool. She's She stands about 16, 16, 1, and she's built like, you know, Von Bell, the Denver Broncos. I mean, she's, she's a linebacker, uh, built bigger than some of the Colts we have. And uh, just a really easygoing, good-tempered filly. Um, T-Max, she is, uh, she's actually going to have her second work back tomorrow uh, in preparation for a stake they have here at Turfway going six and a half on February 11th. Um, she's doing really well. We have high hopes for her. Uh, unfortunately, in, at Churchill, she got hooked in with I mean, in this outlook, I'll, I'll go on camera and say it. I don't think the best three, the best now three year old Philly, I think might be the best three year old in Hoosier Philly. Um, and I had to hook into her. And God almighty, what a Philly. Uh, but, anyways, no shame in running second to her. We're excited about T Max and what she's going to do moving forward. We just kind of gave her some time after that race, just a little freshening, put some weight back on. She had had a good two year old campaign. She had kind of laid it all out there for us. Um, and we've got some other with Frank, uh, Frank Taylor went and bought this, uh, this gelding last week at the January sale, cold name win true that, uh, won a great three up at Woodbine last out. Um, we've got a, we've got a really nice colt that we like quite a bit named clear the air broke his maiden on January 6th. He's, uh, Mike Moreno and Cypress Creeks, um, stable and, Look, I mean, it's, you know, off a of maiden when it's, you know, you don't want to go count your chickens before they hatch, but um, we like this colt quite a bit and we're, you know, we're going to, we're going to point to an allowance race next and depending on how that goes, kind of point our sights towards, you know, what everybody hopes they can do with three-year-old colt in February. You mentioned Frank Taylor a lot. What has he meant to you in your fledgling training career? Because He's just one of the the greatest one of the greatest guys that I've ever met, and it just exudes out of him. He's a big personality. Frank is definitely a big personality. Um, it's it's kind of hard to quantify and put into words exactly what Frank means to me. Like I said, he he plucked me out of a a Wendy's locker room. You know, uh, I had burnt a lot of bridges. Um, broken a lot of trust, um, worked for <clears throat> a lot of really big names in this game. Um, Todd Pletcher, Wesley Ward, Bill Mott, Jonathan Shepard, Dale Romans, uh, when he won the Eclipse Award. Been really fortunate to be a lot of big barns, really nice horses on big days. And, you know, there was a lot of times where I showed up and I was not on my A game. Let's put it that way. Uh, so I say all that to say there wasn't a whole lot of faith in, um, my sobriety continuing, um, at the stage it was at when Frank decided to start this thing, it was still pretty early on. I think I was only seven or eight months sober at the time. Um, and you know, he just took a leap of faith. That's really all it was. Um, he talked to some people, the supporting cast kind of in my life and uh kind of who had their their finger on the pulse um and what was going on in my day to day and all it took was one of them i think to say he's ready and and frank kind of went ahead with this plan and 
and we've just tried to tried to honor him with it really um he's been such a blessing and he's got such a i mean philanthropic doesn't even really do it justice i mean the guy's just got an absolute heart of gold and he just he just wants to give back he just wants to see people succeed he just wants to take the broken and make them whole again um and that's what he did with this stable and that's what he continues to do i got one more question keith whiteley who's keith is keith the pony did keith you get a new pony whiteley yes yes <laughs> so i got hustled into I shouldn't say hustled. I got lassoed and roped and thrown in the back of the car and taken <laughs> to a pony auction uh, about a month ago. And uh, here I am at this pony auction wondering what consignment I should go to. Do I need to fill out a card? No. These things are just hogtied to the back of the sales grounds to a fence post. And I walk up and there's this tiny little yearling I mean, looks white, pink eyes, pink nose, little pony. And uh, this was actually, I can tell you the date. It was December 10th. And I went to buy him. Didn't, didn't, I couldn't pull the trigger on $700 for this little thing. I didn't even, I, we came in a truck. I didn't even know where to take him, how to get him home. So anyways, the day goes by. I'm running Kate's Kingdom in a stake. The first time we're going to be favorite in a stake, this stable's career. And all I can think about is that damn pony. And that he's probably resenting me, you know, that I let him down, basically, that I let him down. I'm here trying to get this Philly prep for a steak, and I, I'm feeling like I was. Anyways, Tessa went behind my back. She bought the pony, uh, and they actually used it as a gender reveal for my son. They put a bunch of, they put a blanket on him, put a little bunch of blue handprints on him, and we unveiled the blanket. Uh, my dad was a big part of it. It was really funny to watch this horse walk around his ankles like a jack russell you know it was hysterical <laughs> well now i know thank now you, you know. and congratulations that's awesome and we look the reason his name's keith is we thought of the most generic white name we could come up with i don't know if we <laughs> have that on camera <laughs> <laughs> bill would be another pretty good one by the bill, way yeah. bill would be a good one. that one hit a little too close to home randy <laughs> Well, Will, we thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on all your success and congratulations on the good work you're doing, not only for yourself, but your whole team. And, and it's, it's really a heartwarming story, easy to root for, and we wish you success in all assets of your life. Thanks so much for joining us on the TDN Writers Room. Appreciate it, Bill. Okay. That was the Green Group Guest of the Week, sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. And as this week's Guest of the Week, Will Walden. We'll get a free one hour tax consultation. Learn more at www.greencode.com and we'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America, but we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting-edge research at Penn Vet to detect gene doping in thoroughbreds, and we endorsed the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race. Well, we've been talking about it for a few weeks, and it's underway right now. The PHBA's Stallion Season Auction. It runs through this Sunday, the 22nd. You can visit thoroughlybred.com to view the av available seasons, which include some Kentucky-based stallions, such as Catalina Cruiser, Game Winner, Mastery, Tacitus, Yaupon, et cetera, and also some Pennsylvania stallions like Brody's Cause, Capo Kane, Smarty Jones, and Uptown Charlie Brown, Pennsylvania bred, 
Pennsylvania sired horses will be eligible, of course, for that upcoming PHBA Stallion Series this summer. Well, it's that time of the year now. We're finally getting into the three-year-old season, getting a couple horses that are re-emerging. A couple stakes races coming up. We have the little comp this Saturday at uh, Santa Anita. But let's take a look back. There's a couple interesting developments last weekend, even though there were no stakes races for three-year-olds. Let's start with Hijazi. Uh, I mean, he's forever going to be known as the $3.55 million purchase from Mir Zaydan and Bob Baffert. And he didn't run poorly in his first three races, but he was still a maiden afterwards. Matter of fact, and Randy can talk about it, he got some very good buyer figures, um, some of the best in the business. But he did win on Saturday at Santa Anita, won a six and a half per long race by a, a length and a quarter. Um, you know, is he going to live up to that price tag? Maybe, maybe not. Probably more likely no. But Randy, I wouldn't give up on this horse. Uh, I mean, he's in such good hands. They did pay all this money for him. He's run some fast numbers. And, uh, you know, look, uh, Bob Baffert, if there's a way to get this horse uh, into the Kentucky Derby and as a contender, who better to figure it out than Bob Baffert? Yeah, I'd kind of like to know the last time we had a maiden race with a horse that had previous buyer speed figures of 191. Right. It's probably happened at some point in the past, but I think it's been a long time. He's obviously a very, very talented horse. Bob, after the race, after his maiden win, uh, was quoted as basically indicating that he thought maybe it was a little too much too soon for Hijazi, some of the races he was, uh, you know, the competition he was asked to run again against last fall. I still have a question as to how far he wants to run, even though he's bred uh, to get a distance of ground, just the way he looks and the way he runs kind of says a little more one turn type horse to me, but uh, he'll certainly get a chance Zoe, to, to uh, prove me wrong there. Yeah, he actually looks like a big scopey horse. Um, I like the way he looks. He also looks like they paid three point five million. He got a ninety-seven buyer speed figure. He's one of three wins on the card for the fifty-seven-year-old Mike Smith. So Mike Smith having a banner day last Saturday, and you know Amar Zidane, he's been loyal to Mike Smith, and it looks like that Mike Smith again at fifty-seven has another horse on the Kentucky Derby trail. I mean, hopefully, we still don't know what Bob's. Bob Baffert's status is going to be moving forward, but Hajazi will be on the trail with or without Bob Baffert. And there, at this point, looms some possibility that there will be only two trainers represented in the Kentucky Derby, Brad Cox, neither Bob Baffert or perhaps Tim Yachtin, to see how that comes out. So Baffert's winning everything on the uh, West Coast, as he often does. But how about this? And, and the Derby future wager for Pool 3, which they're going to bet on this weekend, came out. Brad Cox has 11, 11 horses on this list. It's unbelievable. Now, one of them made some noise last Saturday at Oakland Park, a horse by the name of Verify, ran second last year in the Champagne, uh, then uh, ran so-so in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. But this breeding, Justify out of the Mayor, Diva Delight, can you get better than that? By Justify, a half-brother to Midnight Bisu, you know, certainly didn't, tear the track apart as a two-year-old, but showed a lot of promise. Cox brought him back for this allowance race. And I thought, guys, uh, Randy, he looked, I mean, again, obviously there's some, he he didn't face the, you know, the, the big boys in that one. He looked really good winning by five and a quarter lengths. Um, you know, obviously he'll move on now to a race like the Rebel or the, the one of the races at, uh, at for perhaps fairgrounds, uh, like the Risen Star leading into the Kentucky Derby. But uh, yeah, I, I think he's very much in the mix. Yeah, the Rebel makes the most sense to me. Uh, Cox is training all of his top three-year-olds down at the fairgrounds, even though he runs some of them at Oakland, because the weather is much more predictable in New Orleans than it is at Oakland Park in January, which is a, a common sense kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, when you look at his pedigree, when you look at the 97 buyer speed figure, uh, obviously this horse has all the potential in the world. And Cox right now is just, I mean, to say that he has a deeper roster of legitimate Kentucky Derby horses right now than Bob Baffert does out in California is really saying something. But right now, Brad is just absolutely loaded. Now, you read a lot about this horse uh, in the in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, right? Finished sixth, beat 12 lengths in the Juvenile. And I keep seeing things like a troubled trip and all. And and I think the, the as I'm looking at the past performances, the running line says bumped, bothered, start. 
Uh, unfortunately, you can't get a head-on replay of any of the Breeders' Cup races, which is incredible, on any of the uh, replay purveyors out there. So you can't really get an idea of exactly how bad his trip was. Looking at the pan shot, it doesn't look that bad to me. So I'm not really going to call his race in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile uh, a really troubled trip. Cox points out that he thinks the horse has been a little mentally immature, and maybe he's turned that corner now. But uh, Zoe, yet another three-year-old to watch in that barn. It's amazing. He's terrific. In fact, I am... I remember watching him at Saratoga this summer before he ever ran because we're up there on the roof. And when Brad Cox brings some out, you get the camera ready and and you video them. And I, I can remember looking up. I'm like, what's this verifying? It was, was He wasn't even named there. It was like Diva Delight. I'm like, that sounds really familiar, Diva Delight. I'm like, oh, my God, it's a half to Midnight Be Sue by Justify. So he showed talent from the get go. It's just taken him a while to get it all together. And I think we saw... I mean, yes, he won by five and a half, but it was almost like a grinding five and a half with Martin Garcia, who's like popped out of the clouds to ride for Brad Cox. So maybe he's picked up a a, whore, a three-year-old on the trail, um, but verifying definitely a very good horse going forward. And Cox, ah, loaded. He's loaded at Oaklawn and he's loaded at the fairgrounds. He's got Hit Show, Corona Bolt, Jace's Road, Angel Empire, you name it, he's got it. He's winning at 45% at the fairgrounds. 45%. That is huge. Yeah, what he's doing is amazing. So on Saturday at Gulfstream, and you get this this time of year, you get these maiden races where, and primarily it's it's Pl Todd Pletcher time. You're going to see him unveil some of these you know, beautifully bred colts that weren't quite ready for the two-year-old races. And he ran a, a trio of horses on Saturday at Gulfstream in the fifth race McCarty had a first-time starter by the name of Cuvier and a first-time starter by the name of uh, Sergeant Pepper. Uh, the news there was from a, uh, both the way they bet the race and from the prices paid for these horses, Cuvier cost $140,000 and went up at 9 to 1. Sergeant Pepper cost $1.6 million and went off at 6 to 5. So what happened? Of course, Cuvier at 9 to 1 won uh, in there. Doesn't that always seem to be the case? Then he came back in the eighth race. By the way, the fifth was a, a six furlong race. The eighth was a mile. He ran a first time starter by the name of King's uh, Board, uh, who was an $800,000 uh, purchase uh, by Uncle Mo, won by one and three quarter lengths at three to one. So he got the job done in both races. Um, but I think the you know the conventional wisdom, most people weren't you know phenomenally impressed with these horses. Can they go on and be nice horses, of course, but, you know, are they going to jump onto everybody's top five list for the Kentucky Derby? By no means at this point. Also, it's so odd that, you know, the Sergeant Pepper horse, which was getting all the hype, was the, you know, finished sixth and the horse that they, you know, at least the betters gave, you know, very little chance to. Cuvier did win the race. But, um, you know, Todd, Todd's very good at this. You know, I'm sure we'll see these horses down the road in some of the Derby preps. But again, um, I think right now they're kind of the B-level horses. Yeah, of the, of the two or three that you mentioned, I think Kings Barnes has the best chance to go on and do something. I mean, when you look at that maiden race that he won, uh, a telltale sign that it wasn't a particularly fast race. He wins by a length and three quarters. Then it was a neck between second and third, three quarters between third and fourth, three quarters between fourth and fifth. When you get horses bunched like that, especially in a maiden race, it's a sign that it's not really that fast of a race, he got a buyer speed figure of 74. But looking at his pedigree, I think the running time was maybe a little bit better than you would think, uh, given the <clears throat> given the surface at Gulfstream that day for a 74 buyer. So I think he'll turn out to be okay, but no, uh, he's definitely got a lot of improving to do if you're gonna think of him as a top rated three-year-old. Yeah, Kings Barn, the final time there, 139.18 for him. He's out of a half sister to Gossip Girl, out of Lady Tappet. So He's well-bred on just about any surface. As far as Cuvier, I think he got some of his father's gutsiness. He's bi-collected. He was headed every step of the way going three quarters. Now, I, I'm sure he's going to stretch out. Is he fabulous? I don't know, but he certainly was determined uh, winning that maiden race going six furlong. Sergeant Pepper, just a toss. I would simply just draw a line through that and take another look at him next time he's entered. So speaking of Brad Cox, there is a three-year-old prep race this weekend at the Fairgrounds of the LeCompte. And lo and behold, of course, he has the favorite in here, an instant coffee. Um, this is a horse who, uh, in the breeders, this goes back to show you what a strong race 
the Breeders' Futurity, which was won by Forte, who came back to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, was. Instant Coffee finished fourth, beaten seven lengths, comes back in the Kentucky Jockey Club and wins that for Luis Saez and Brad Cox. Uh, he'll be the favorite in there. Cox also has a horse by the name of Tappet's Conquest. Um, looks okay, uh, but maybe not as strong as the other one. Uh, Randy, get a chance to take a look at this race. It looks like uh, perhaps Brad Cox is going to uh, keep marching through the three-year-old preps, uh, especially at Fairgrounds in Oakland. You know, I mean, I think Instant Coffee deserves to be the favorite. Uh, the win in the Kentucky Jockey Club only got an 82 buyer speed figure, but he also rallied from four lengths off of a very slow pace. And he was three wide around the first turn and four wide around the second turn. So his race was better than that number indicates. But I don't think he's a slam dunk. And I want to throw out a horse in here. I'm just going to roll him out there for people to think about. And he may be eight to one, uh, six to one or eight to one. Far outside post, a horse named Two Fills. Now, if you go back and you look at his last couple of races in the Breeders' Futurity, um, he tried to bolt around the first turn. And consequently, he was much further back early than you would have expected him to be. And again, it was against very tough competition. So I kind of discount that race a little bit. Then he came back last time out in the street sense at Churchill Downs. And yes, it was on a sloppy racetrack, but he had the worst trip of any horse in the street sense. And yet he still wins the race by five lengths. I had, the figure wasn't all that good. I understand that. But I think this horse is maybe a little bit better than he gets credit for, and he could be a decent price. And I think he's got a legitimate chance uh, to upset instant coffee. Yeah, he's drawn way on the outside as well, which I think is going to help him. There's a, there's a long run in that stretch, two fills. I think he appreciated a little bit of moisture in the track that sloppy track street sense, but uh, I'm with you. I like two fills, but there is a chance that the best three-year-old is not running in a stake on Saturday. And that's race number nine, guys. Banishing, Brendan Walsh, a Godolphin homebred. We hear Godolphin all over again. Um, he's by Ghost Zapper. He ran faster winning his maiden race than Jace's Road ran in the Gunrunner stakes the day he won his maiden. So watch out for Banishing. And let us not forget as well, the girls are running, guys. Uh, we'll get to see the Silver Bullet Day as well on Saturday. And the return of Chop Chop. I mean, she was the favorite in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, was she not? Can she bounce back? Oh, we will certainly find out on Saturday. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV Workout of the Week is Speaking Scout. Seen working here on the training track at Santa Anita in 48 and 1, Speaking Scout is already down at Gulfstream Park in preparation for the Pegasus Turf. He's also working with the Grey Wizards seen here and he'll run this weekend at Santa Anita. We'll be right back after this message from XBTV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for just a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtb.com. We've talked a lot about Flightline, and deservedly so. The world's top-rated racehorse. Well, of course, West Point was one of the partners in Flightline, and they also have a stakes performer Coming up on Saturday, Gold for Kitten runs for West Point in the Astra Stakes, trained by John Sadler in partnership with another one of Flightline's owners, the majority owner, Ronus Racing. Good luck to all the connections of Gold for Kitten. This week's Remy cartoon is in, and Remy was certainly, well, we know what he was doing last weekend. He was watching football games. 
because he's got a starting gate and he's got 12 horses in the gate and a horse of the auxiliary gate and all the uh, jockeys on the, the one through 12 are looking over. And it's not the also eligible, it's the wild card horse. So the wild card weekend, last weekend uh, for the NFL. Well, that does it for this week's edition of the Thoroughbred Daily News Writer's Room Podcast. I want to thank our guest of the week, our Green Group guest of the week, Will Walden. I want to thank my cohorts, Randy Moss and Zoe Cabin, as well as our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petrudiak, our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aaliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. See you next week.